Linda Hoffman is an author, a sculptor, a poet, an orchardist. She studied art, masks, and theater in Paris, France, and after college traveled on a Watson Traveling Fellowship to Japan. And upon returning to the US, felt inspired by the poetry and the beauty of traditional Japanese arts. And she began an exploration of narrative sculpture, incorporating language, fibers, wood stone, and found objects. Her artwork includes indoor and outdoor sculpture and public installations, digital prints, and the fine art letterpress book, Winter Air. Her work has been in, is in permanent collections at the Boston Public Library, New York, Washington, DC, Harvard, and she is the curator of her farm's outdoor sculpture exhibit. She is the fruit grower also at Old Frog Pond Farm in Harvard. Linda has written three chapbooks of poetry, and she writes a blog, Apple's Art and Spirit, based on her observations about the farm. And she is presently working on her memoir about bringing back the abandoned orchard at Old Frog Pond Farm. Please help me welcome Linda Hoffman. <laughs> Repairing the Broken. The world breaks everyone. Then some become strong in the broken places. Ernest Hemingway. In the Japanese pottery world, there is an old tradition, kintsugi, golden joinery, of repairing a broken pot with gold. The pot might have been a prize tea ceremony bowl, revered with the eye and treasured with the hand. Instead of tossing the pot broken by some mishap into the rubbish pile, the pieces would be fitted back together and held by lacquer mixed with gold powder. Kintsugi became an art form, a newly repaired bowl with threads of gold has more appeal than the unbroken one. Kintsugi is connected to the Japanese philosophy of wabi-sabi. Wabi might translate as loneliness or solitariness, the sight of a lone crow on a crooked branch, or a plum blossom peeking through light snow. Sabi refers to objects that exude the worn rustic patina of age. Wabi-sabi informs the aesthetics of the tra traditional Japanese arts. An object doesn't need to be discarded because it's worn and old. On the contrary, we can treasure it even more. I lived in Japan in my early 20s, and I consider wabi-sabi to be a strong influence on my own aesthetics. I love using old tools, worn objects, and wood in my art wood with its knots, rings, and branch collars carry the history of the life of the tree. Similarly, pottery carries its past, the clay created in the earth hundreds of years ago. We have an intuitive attraction to that which is old and from the earth. We trust its wisdom. Without knowing about Kintsugi, when I made my first large outdoor large-scale outdoor sculpture using tree logs from a hundred-year-old maple that fell in a winter storm, I gold-leafed its sawn surfaces <coughs> to highlight its beauty and give it new life. The repairs of Kintsugi draw our attention to the impermanence of life. In fact, it's emphasized and celebrated. The repair to the bowl adds to its beauty. How is it that our culture wants to deny this reality from blemish-free apples to wrinkle-free faces to the ideal relationship? We are directed to strive for perfection as if it was attainable and permanent. In the third stanza of Jane Hirschfield's poem, For What Binds Us, she writes, 
and see how the flesh grows back across a wound with a great vehemence more strong than the simple untested surface before. There's a name for it on horses when it comes back darker and raised, proud flesh. I recall as a child, as I'm sure many of you do, sitting with friends and sharing our scars, our battle stories. I have a tea mug I use every day. It's one that my son Alex, a potter and founder of East Fork Pottery made over 10 years ago. It's the only piece of pottery that still exists from that time. At home, we keep all our mugs on two open shelves in the kitchen. But when my beloved Alex mug is on the shelf and a house guest decides to choose a cup, they infallibly choose this one. There is little about it that would make you prefer it from among two shelves of mugs. Yet, there must be something that communicates, whether it is our intuitive attraction to the patina of age or the subtle, subtle power of something treasured. No one seems to be concerned with the hairline crack down the inside of it. I care for this mug tenderly. I appreciate it. Maybe we can imagine the earth not as a small mug, but as a giant teapot. And I say that because as a sculptor, I did make a giant teapot this size, out of leaves. And in the blog, there's a photo. You don't have one, but it is natural materials and it has to be refreshed periodically. Fortunately, the earth offers plenty of gold for repairs. The sun's gold feeds the trees and the autumn leaves glow, surprisingly brilliant despite this year's drought. The gold we need for each repair is available in many forms. A hot bowl of soup, a knitted scarf, a poem, acts of courage, love, and compassion. We can see them as all, all as gold threads we offer to heal this earth and each other. Eventually, my Alex mug will likely break. I'm going to have to learn to make a Kintsugi repair in preparation for that day. Thank you. This next piece from the memoir is title is Agricultural Tools. As an artist, when something disturbs me, it settles into my unconscious and before long, I find it appearing in my art. Today, I live on a farm in Harvard where I tend 300 organic apple trees, 40 Asian pears, and a large raspberry crop. But 15 years ago, I was an artist who lived in Groton with my husband and three children. Growing fruit was not on my radar, though, like many New Englanders, we went apple picking every fall. There was always a festive atmosphere of pumpkins, corn stalks, and apple baskets on Old Air Road in September. Hundreds of people came with their cars packed for a day in the country. A traffic cop directed the crossing as diesel tractors pulled hay wagons filled with families to different blocks of the orchard. Long lines formed at the farm stand windows and customers paid for their bag before they headed into the trees for picking. We picked apples climbing often to the top of that beautiful orchard. Then one year the orchard closed. A sadness blanketed the hillside. The old tree stood one year, then two, then three without being pruned. No longer were there white clouds of flowers in spring and fruit pulling down the upright branches in fall. What was happening in Groton was no different than all over the country. In the United States between 1900 and 2010, the number of farms decreased from 30 million to 2 million, mm -hmm. a staggering tsunami of change. 
Living in rural New England in the 90s, I had a first row seat to witness this disappearance of farmland from the landscape. The vanishing happened as quickly as a magician's trick. An apple orchard became Orchard Lane with 25 new houses. A dairy farm became Easy Acres, a subdivision with 40 duplexes. It was sad to watch and there was nothing I could do. As I said, when something bothers me, it comes out in my art. I put a notice in the local newspaper asking for donations of old agricultural tools for an artwork about the disappearance of farmland. From one small notice in the Groton Herald, the phone started to ring. I had touched something with my request for old agricultural tools. People responded with warmth and generosity. Usually, it was a single tool, a saw that had belonged to a grandfather, a scythe, or a treasured rake. One man offered me rough sawn boards with sinuous edges. In little time, I had a collection of tools that evoked human effort, the sweat and muscle of hard labor. The first one I took to work with was a heavy garden fork. I took a selection of colors from my box of shaker tape, the remnant material from chair, make, chair making I had been given from a family friend, the owner of shaker workshops. I wove these colorful bands through the tines of the fork and wrote a poem to accompany the sculpture. <coughs> the weaving of fields, ancestry creation, autumn grasses, scatter fallen seeds. Another tool was a gift from a veterinarian in Groton, and she gave me a beautiful five foot saw. I was definitely a tree hugger. I hated to see trees taken down along town roads. I bemoaned electric wires that could cut through their butchered canopies. There was a great tree in the common near the Nashua River. One day, a large painted orange X appeared on it. The next day, I spray painted that X brown to match the bark, and the state highwaymen drove right by it. <laughs> The second sculpture was marked trees, made with this five-foot saw blade, bands of green cloth, and long slivers of sawn wood. The poem. Green woods, old pasture, buried rust. The saw, sharp silence of marked trees. I loved these tools and the stories they suggested. They brought out sorrow, loneliness, and longing. The loss of landscape echoed an ache inside my own body. I felt connection and certainty working with the tools, creating an art form that was poetic and spare, in essence, that Japanese aesthetic of wabi-sabi. A wheel, a bucket, an old piece of rope became the sculpture Empty Barn. The poem, sorrow twisting through knotted rope, tautness of humanity and earth intertwined. I wanted to save more trees, farmland, any open space. I would have daydreams driving through town of being able to buy houses and raise them to the ground for more open land. Saving a woodlot is relatively easy. Saving a farm is not as simple because you need a farmer. An artist, when something disturbs me, it settles into my unconscious and before long I find it appearing in my art. I enjoyed working on this first group of agricultural tool sculptures, and two years later I decided to do a second series, but this time there was something new that I was expressing. On a particularly curvaceous, rough-edged board, I attached nails wired flat like elongated drops of rain and gave its title In Hot Sunlight. The poem, sweat droplets fo float seed-like, down brow, neck, and breast. Earth is parched, waiting for rain. I couldn't hide the unhappiness I felt in my marriage. My husband could only watch as the suffering of my emotional body appeared in this work. After much talking, a little therapy, both separately and together, I said to him, I can't do this anymore. I was the one who would find a new place to live. I wanted somewhere with bedrooms for my three children and a studio for making sculpture. At the suggestion of a friend, I visited A&M Orchards in Harvard, Massachusetts. 
It was mud season. Winter's old snow and patches of bare ground met my eye. Nothing green hinted towards Persephone's eventual rise from Hades. The house needed paint and the outbuildings begged for repair. I'd never before contemplated owning a house by myself, let alone a small farm. I was not sure I deserved this, but I followed the realtor inside. I remember a few pieces of furniture, but otherwise it didn't feel particularly inviting as all personal items had been cleared away. In the kitchen, I first felt comfortable. Dark pine boards covered the walls and ceiling. There were no drawers or cabinets, only open shelves for plates, bowls, mugs, and glasses. Along one wall on the floor, heavy pots for making jam and stalks stood like sentinels. Above a wood-burning cook stove hung a patchwork of blackened iron pans. No fancy countertop covered the surfaces. This was a work kitchen. We walked upstairs and I thought, if this house has hot water, everything will be fine. <laughs> I turned on the hot water faucet in the 1960s avocado colored sink in the master bedroom. Warmth ran over my fingertips. I followed the realtor peeking into several small bedrooms, enough for my children to each have their own. We walked outside. Can I see the chicken coop? Inside the white clabbered shed, I picked my way through splattered sawdust and teased away thick curtains of cobwebs. Some 40 old hens squawked, panicked by my presence. What's going to happen to all these chickens, I asked the realtor. Why? Would you want them? <laughs> Why not, I thought to myself, not knowing anything about chickens. How difficult could they be to care for? <laughs> sure, I said. I'll ask the owners for you, the realtor responded. The other side of the chicken coop housed an orange Kubota tractor. It came with the property. I looked away, unable to imagine climbing onto its seat. Alongside the shed, a rickety fence marked the winter over remains of a sizable kitchen garden. I loved tending a small garden and growing a few vegetables, but this was a real garden that could feed a family all winter. Nearby, a brown two-story garage was empty. Here would be my studio with space for the rusty metal old tools and the machines I used to make sculpture. The listing had mentioned an old orchard. Where are the apples, I asked. He gestured casually across the street. The road was lined with old apple trees. We crossed the street and followed an old cart road that bordered the orchard. I peered down through rows of bare branches. What would you do with the apples, he asked. I don't know, I heard myself say. I'd have to learn. It's hard to grow apples, he cautioned. I could feel a small delight rise. Pears, cherries, and peaches are all delicious, but apples figure in mythology, history, science, and even religion. I wondered, could I grow apples? On July 1st, 2001, I signed papers and became the sole owner of the farm. I changed the name from A&M Orchards to Old Frog Pond Farm after the haiku by the 17th century Japanese poet Basho, his poem. Old pond, frog jumps, splash. <laughs> I made a postcard and sent it to friends. On the front side, there was a photograph I had taken of the pond and floating above it, I added an image of a frog. The caption read, plunging into the unknown. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs>
through the low gate of loss, loss of who you knew, whoever you thought you might be. When forwards the one way, trust these vinings that join branch to beam, rough to planed, sill to jam. Trust voices the other side, inch through, stand, out of fog, into shape, look, all you need, a roof, a bed, a table, a fire, a well. Thank you. While walking near the meditation hut, one unsettled morning, I felt several raindrops and remembered back to times when I've been caught in the woods during dangerous storms, as well as back to the other, less terrifying times. I've taught lessons on sensory imagery and have forgotten one. When the answer is touch. The next time you are stumped, the four fingers of one hand held up, your waiting thumb slumped across your palm, unticked. Consider then the worrisome itch and the rush of ferns against your shins. Consider the wind-whipped slap, the drenching splash, and the sudden summer storm that stung you with its wrath. Consider the constriction of your throat. You won't forget again. myself on the great white way now getting home is all that's on my mind well I'm a small town girl and I love to walk those hills how did I end up in New York City where only the buildings are higher than my heating bills. How did I end up in New York City? 
where there are way too many cars and I cannot see the stars how did I end up in New York City I'm a Mendocino girl and I live down near the bay how did I end up in New York City Thank you. Yesterday's turned into tomorrow's. Some days when I wake and I lie there, still floating in some dream, half here, half there, I see you. I hear your tender voice with its slight lilt. I see your soft smile. I feel your warm touch. I smell your innocence, your seduction, your eternity. It startles me. I sit bolt upright, sweating, shaking, and I think I could almost reach out and hold you, but I can't. You are gone. No matter how many times I think of what I should have done or said, you still go. No more shaking, no more sharing inside jokes, holding hands, dancing to Quincy Jones, the dude, sipping wine in the moonlight, no more you. Yesterday's turn into tomorrow's, but the sorrow never goes away. Whoever said time heals never lost you. When eternity arrives and I see you in your mini skirt full of youth and excitement, I reach out and hold you tight. I will hold you tight forever. Yeah. Thank you. Jasmine, rosemary.